Welcome. This is so exciting. This is our kickoff call of this series. And so my name's Bryn. Um, I'm the head of community at HVCI, which is the Hudson Valley Center for Innovation. And so you'll see some of my team members here. Actually, everybody's here. Pam Miner's here, Johnny's here, Paul's here, and, and Danny's also here. So, um, and as you maybe heard a little bit, we're all dispersed in different parts of the country. I'm actually in Portland, Maine, but um, and Paul's out west. Same with Danny. Yep. Uh, Johnny and Pam are in and around Hudson Valley, but we all have roots there also. So that was kind of how this team has come together. And we're all entrepreneurs ourselves. So you know, a lot of the work that we do is entrepreneurship for other entrepreneurs. So that's why we're here today, running the Think Dutch's Gears program. And yeah, this is going to be the series for the next six weeks. Like I said, it has a cadence. You guys are all registered. You, you've seen the days that it's going to happen. It's always going to be at 11 a.m. And if there are glitches in the schedule, we're starting to realize that like holidays are creeping up. We realize some of the other components of the program, um, sounding boards or one-on-ones, if you're a company that's applied and has been accepted into the program, some of those will also shift and move around. So we just ask that you guys be flexible with us. Um, yeah, I think everybody here gets that. So yeah, um, this is the Gears program. It's a free innovative program and it's going to help you and your startup or your small business grow and thrive. So we're offering these weekly episodes. You'll see that it's like six to eight weeks again, because things will shift. Uh, we're going to have specific topics for each week and entrepreneurial challenges that come up. I'm sure you guys have all faced um, the things that we've also faced as uh, other entrepreneurs. And we're going to help you sort of clarify your plan um, moving forward around what the topic is so with that we'll coincide one-on-one -on -one support with some of our experts we've got lots of people in our network and then the sounding boards are our group weekly small discussions um, that help you sort of implement what we've discussed in this series and so the series also is going to be more of like a podcast feel we want it to be somewhat of a discussion but today you'll see Danny, Johnny, and I sort of ping-ponging back and forth about our own experiences as entrepreneurs, a live discussion. You know, as you guys saw, today is like know your customer. So we're going to be talking about some um, things that we've used in the past, um, some exercises that really help you understand and know your customer. And we'll also provide those PDF worksheets after. And again, if you can't make every episode in real time, you don't have to worry about it. All episodes in the series are going to be recorded and available um, on our own platform, um, which is going to be a landing page. And I think it'll, what I'm going to do is put it on our YouTube channel, but I think it'll appear on the Think Dutch's Gears page also. And so all that info will go out to you guys. I'm also going to put some links into our chat today, which are an application form if you guys are a business and you haven't applied to be in the program. And again, that would include this web series, one-on-one -on -one expert advising sessions, and then sounding boards. So I'll put that link in there. I'm also going to put in our Slack channel link. And if you aren't you aren't in there, that's a lot of where our communication is going to happen. So I'll, I'll add that in. And then there's one other thing I'm going to put in. Um, probably our landing page. I'll just have you guys have that info also. And so I think that covers mostly the groundwork around what this is going to entail for the next couple of weeks. And I'll just tell you a little bit more about myself. And so again, my name's Bryn. I'm a founder as well. So I founded a company called Awen and I am a family recovery and relationship coach. So I help and support those impacted by a loved one's substance use disorder. And at the end of 2019, I had left a sort of corporate job in startup world. Uh, I was a, an HR executive and I was like, I really want to do something for myself and something that I've been impacted by. Uh, my sister's been in recovery for eight years. I knew I wanted to help and do something more for families. I think families really get left behind. And I was like, I'm going to get certified. I'm going to figure this out. And then I also got in touch with Danny. Uh, again, we have roots in the Hudson Valley and I went through 
our own accelerator program. And so after that, um, I've now joined the team. So I've been with the team now for almost two years. And yeah, it's been awesome. Again, I'm on this journey with you guys. I know how hard it is to start a business, but also how fulfilling it is. And I've, um, I have, I have business now. It's insane. I have like five clients. It's really exciting and growing and it's, it's really great. So I'm super happy to be here and excited to be a part of the gears program and obviously HVCI. So I think that covers me and what the, the program is going to entail. So I'm just going to hand it off to Johnny now. Great. Thank you so much, Bryn. Uh, uh all of that information Bryn provided for many of you, uh, hopefully it's a review. And for those it's not, I hope you absorbed it. And if you didn't, as Bryn shared, we will be sharing information over Slack and email. If you're not in our Slack channel yet, please make sure you get involved in that. And if parts of the program that Bryn outlined didn't quite sink in, don't worry, we're gonna go to it in a little bit more detail. Uh, but with that, a little bit about myself. So my name is Johnny Lee Hain, and I am Hudson Valley Center for Innovation's Head of Growth and Lead Advisor. Uh, I started my career as an electrical engineer and worked at America Online in software coding, quality assurance, operations, and management. So sort of that big business enterprise experience before I accidentally launched a business, bootstrapped a business uh, in social sports from zero to $10 million over 20 years. Uh, alongside after that journey, uh, I moved back to the Hudson Valley where I grew up and got involved in launching an investment fund, uh, an angel investment fund called Hudson Valley Startup Fund. So that was really my journey from bootstrap entrepreneur to really understanding venture scale advisory and investment. And as I look at the folks who have joined this program, I'm really excited to see the full breadth of businesses, business types and styles from literally farm stands and individual gym and fitness companies to companies with a venture scale plan that really wanna raise money and go to market. So sometimes that can be a big challenge to serve many masters, but I believe that the group we have assembled and the format that we're gonna provide will be enriching grounding and either new information or great reminders for everyone. And we'll dig a little bit more later into how the program dives deeper at every level from these open sessions that all are invited to to the sounding board roundtables and then into the deeper dives. Each week we will invite uh, a subject matter expert, which might often be Danny, as he is uh, the person who wrote most of the curriculum and topics that we're gonna review in this seminar. Um, we may bring in some other folks and a set of entrepreneurs that we know that have gone through the same experiences that you're going through now. So as Bryn said, this will be conversational our intent here is not to handhold in this session, but to inform and inspire and give you an opportunity to dig deeper into the topics, tool sets and mindsets that we're sharing here. And you can dig deeper independently, or you can dig deeper with us in our sounding boards and deep dives, uh, which are the one-on-one -on -one sessions. With that, uh, I am gonna introduce Danny Pataki, who is our former executive director at the Hudson Valley Center of Innovation. And he really, created the organization that is providing this program today. With that, Danny, why don't you share a little bit about yourself and then we'll dive into more details of the program and our topic for today. Great, thanks, Johnny. Thanks, Bryn. Appreciate being here. It's it's awesome to be contributing still in, in a way, you know, in fashion. Uh, I think anything that is hyper-focused on local economic growth and and personal professional development of entrepreneurs is a is a win-win situation and you know at, at Dutchess County and, and Sarah Lee specifically you know is championing a lot of the cause uh, to make that happen and you know especially coming off of the uh, the innovation challenge and and things like that so it's great to to be here I I'll give a, a, a brief background and just kind of hit the high marks if there's any things I should fill in Johnny just let me know uh, I'll, I'll start from now and work backwards. Uh, currently, I am a head of growth at a, a private equity firm focused on real estate development and investment. Uh, and and we, we focus on luxury real estate in primary markets of uh, Montana. Uh, we moved out here uh, over the past year, uh, largely because we've had family in Bozeman in Big Sky, and it was you know kind of time to join them uh, and, and, and adventure uh, this way in our life. So we have 
four children. My wife and I, we, we met at Iona College. Or, I'm sorry, Iona University. That was a vintage statement there. Uh, I was about to say, you got to take that back. Rick Patino would be very <laughs> upset at you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I, I won't call the Bronxville campus Concordia, which is what I grew up <laughs> sneaking into the gym with Jimmy Janicek and playing basketball. Um, oh, now we talking. Yeah, now we talking. So, um, yeah, we, we've been together. Yeah, we've been together for about 20 years, uh, four children ages two and a half to 12, uh, which is, you know, a, a great part of our life and a lot of joy. Uh, having built a lot of companies through that and supported a lot, you know, I always want to recognize the family work balance uh, and, and how much of that is needed. It's a big part of growing the revenue of a company. You need to be so focused on yourself as well. Uh, so I'll just throw that in as a nugget, perhaps. Um, so I, you know, before that, running Hudson Valley Center for Innovation, it really was a a mission of growing it from, you know, kind of one-on-one -on -one consulting at the time in 2017, all the way to programs that could scale entrepreneurs. Uh, in the Hudson Valley, and and we always define that from you know the seven counties in the region, from Westchester all the way up north to Dutchess and and Ulster. Uh, then the pandemic happened, and we really focused a lot on small businesses on Main Street. Uh, but I think we came out of that and said to ourselves, wait a second, about ninety percent of this is is almost the same type of challenge. So I would double down on anything that we talk about needs to be employed today by a solo entrepreneur all the way to the other side of the spectrum uh, for a business development team at a corporate fortune 50 company and in, in fact what we're going to talk about today came from there and has since been applied uh, to entrepreneurship prior to that i was running business development and strategic initiatives for a couple different startup companies mainly in the tech data analytics space so we lived in uh, in Washington, D.C. And, and Boston and a little bit of Silicon Valley before that. So um, that was a good time. And, you know, went to Iona Prep as well. I'll just throw that in too. Um, and, you know, grew up in the in Yonkers and in Westchester. So uh, I can round out everything, Johnny, as we talk. Great. Thank you so much, Danny. Uh, I also want to welcome, though they're going to be on mute, uh, Pam Miner and Paul Mungia, who are also uh, on the HVCI team. So you may be interacting with them on Slack, uh, email, coordinating, uh, and receiving and providing feedback as we go along. Uh, so thank both of you for that. I promise that's the biggest HVI commercial you will hear mm -hmm. during these six weeks. Uh, but we really feel it's important that you get to know us. Uh, we may not get to know each of you in these sessions, but in other aspects of the program, we expect to get to know all of the folks who participate in the full program very well. And Slack, again, I'll remind everyone, is going to be a great way to share and learn as well, whether you're in the full program or not. With that, we're going to spend just a few more minutes. I'm going to maybe repeat some of what we've said earlier, but clearly outline the program so that folks understand the three different aspects of the program and what is open to everyone versus what is part of the application and acceptance process. Um, so as Bryn shared, this is the open portion of the program, six about one hour uh, seminars that are in more of a panel or podcast format. We're not gonna dig deep into every worksheet that we might introduce or every concept. We're not gonna walk you through step to step how to do it, but we're gonna highlight the program We'll provide over Slack and email links to tools and deeper dives into these uh, these different topics. And we really encourage you uh, to learn more through uh, that independent offline work or with us. So uh, these we're calling the web series. Uh, at, we're trying to make them every Tuesday at 11. As Bryn noted, we may need to move one or two and we'll give you info for that. And they're all going to be recorded. So if you can't make it, it's not a big deal. This isn't an, a necessarily an intimate discussion so much as a, a panel conversation. As time allows, we will take questions and we always wanna make sure we clarify what we're talking about. So if something is unclear, please raise your hand, your digital hand, uh, which is the center button uh, on the bottom of your menu there. The second part that we've talked about, we call sounding boards. These are also sometimes referred to as masterminds, but these are gonna be small groups of three to seven uh, company founders that get together for an hour. Most of our groups are Thursday mornings and we have one uh, Monday evenings. 
this is going to be a chance for these folks to work the plan. So whatever topic we discuss, such as today, we're going to talk about customer discovery and the jobs to be done methodology. <laughs> Hopefully those of you who have uh, a sounding board on Thursday, will dig into those some and try to draft a worksheet or do some of the interviewing that we recommend and then come to the sounding board sharing how that's going for you and, and getting clarification on how you can make best use of the tool. We'll do that each week in those programs. Also in the sounding boards, we're going to push folks to share wins over the last week to help you develop a cadence of uh, success and defining what success looks like and then achieving it. Challenges in terms of I thought I was going to get X done, but I didn't. And, you know, am I just a terrible person, an entrepreneur for that? Or maybe, you know, other people have similar challenges and then dig a little bit deeper and set some challenges for ourselves for the following week. So, again, that's a, a little bit uh, deeper dive into the topics and a little bit deeper dive into accountability. The last aspect of the program, again, for those who apply and are accepted, and we have a few slots left in this program, are the one on ones. So these are up to two one hour deep dives. Again, we wanna focus on the content and the topics that we're sharing through the program. Um, and these will be uh, scheduled as available, but we should have enough room for most of the folks in the program to have up to two sessions to really dig deeper. Beyond that, we encourage you uh, to reach out to HVCI, Dutchess County and other resources that we can help provide uh, to you to help you continue to move your business along. Uh, Bryn, Danny, did I miss anything on the outline of the program there? All right, great. Awesome, well, I was afraid we were gonna run a little low on time, but I think that we're right on schedule. Mm -hmm. With that, I will actually open up uh, to see if we have any questions um, about the program itself from anybody in the audience. And please note there are two links in the chat uh, for our Slack group to join our Slack group and the application for those folks who haven't uh, joined the program or filled out an application. To be clear, some folks have registered. That gets you into the calendar for six weeks for this series. The application gives you the opportunity to join the sounding boards and access to the one-on-ones. So hopefully that makes sense to everyone. Okay. Awesome. All right, with that, we're gonna jump into the content. Um, and, and as I shared previously, um, our focus today is customer discovery and personas. And each week, we're gonna hit a topic that may seem brand new for some folks, and may be like, I already know this stuff. I've already done this work. I've been in the business for five years, 10 years, whatever it is. We really encourage everyone to come to this program with fresh eyes. All of you have expressed an interest in growing your business either growing your existing business or growing a new portion of your business or launching a business that hasn't achieved revenue yet. Um, so again, regardless of what stage your business is in, we really ask you to take this opportunity to step back. We like to say, not a term we invented, that we're here to work on your business, not in your business. And as I read the applications, a lot of you are looking at that struggle. I'm, I got to be there all day long. How do I you know, think about things like financial planning or redefining who my customer is? That's what we hope that this program will help you get into. With that, um, I'm actually going to ask Danny to sort of kick it off because he introduced me to this topic. And what we're talking about here is the problem or opportunity that we're solving in our business. I've looked over the application and we are everything from high tech dog collars to personal gym training, to selling flowers, to how do I move selling uh, fresh produce online if I'm a brick and mortar store, to expanding a comic book shop with new ideas. We're, we're all over the place, but all of us need to know who our customer is and what problem we're solving for our customer. So. A decade or two ago, this question was asked um, of, I believe, a Harvard professor, and he came to a realization of a new methodology for looking at that. And with, with that, Danny, I'm going to ask you to give us a, a sort of a shortened story of, of the genesis of the Jobs to be Done framework. Sure. <clears throat> Thanks. I had a chance uh, also to look at some of the, you know, the folks that are on today and kind of what business spectrum that we're, we're working with today. And so Maggie, I might might 
put you on the spot about stems uh, if, if, if it works out, but you know, it's very relevant to what we're talking about today too. Um, so I'm trying to give context as well to who's you know on today as well and, and who might join. Uh, in sum, Clay Christensen, Harvard Business School professor at the time, eventually was Professor Emeritus at Harvard Business School in retirement and who's known as sort of the father of disruptive innovation uh, throughout the whole startup entrepreneur movement, you know, from like the mid 80s onward. Uh, he he came up with what was called the jobs to be done methodology. And it's based on finding the job that the customer has that you need to fulfill. Um, before I dive into details, the example I always give, because I really, really wanted to do it, but but failed often in, in Hurley when we lived there, is that if I wanted to mow my lawn on a Saturday, um, I think most people like I would always think I have to get up earlier or plan a time, especially in the, the heat of the summer with humidity, to do it you know, at certain times in a certain way with certain equipment. Uh, but what Clay Christensen would say is you actually have about seven or eight options uh, that you're not realizing. You know, I could hire someone else to do it. I could have my son do it, who's 10 years old at the time. I could take the grass up in my backyard and put down turf so I never have to do it. Uh, I could, you know, move uh, into a, a condo complex that there's HOA fees and someone else does it and I don't even have to think about it. The point is it expands the aperture of what the options are that the customer is actually thinking about and talking about and saying and doing over and over and over again. And the question that he posed came from, you know, what job needs to be done with the customer came from a consulting project for McDonald's who provided him a top five list of the most selling uh, margin profit based items uh, at McDonald's. And he had to go figure out because in, in retail sales and food and beverage, the top three SKUs are always sell the most. They sort of carry the organization in a way. Uh, so if you're selling SKUs, you know, try to assess those top three that you're always selling. And he came back uh, based on his research and said a vanilla milkshake uh, is one of the top selling and you need to go sell it to uh, middle class workers who wear white or blue shirts who are commuting to work in the morning because they sell the most between 6 to 8 a.m. in the morning. Um, and that's why it's one of the top five of your products. So if you target um, middle class workers who are commuting and actually he figured out an average of 27 minutes on a commute, uh, that then you will uh, have greater sales from that product. And it sort of blew everyone's minds to the point where I think the marketing executives didn't really want to enact on that type of advice because they were still thinking based on demographics and not on circumstance, and that's the difference, uh, of why would a worker buy a vanilla milkshake in the morning at 6 a.m.? And the answers included things like, well, we interviewed thousands and thousands of people across all these different McDonald's locations, and they don't like yogurt. They, do, they can't eat cereal on their commute in the car. They have to get to work. They don't like tea or coffee. So in fact, they buy vanilla milkshakes. And it, it really expands the aperture of the types of options that you have to discover and figure out what your job really is. I don't think a McDonald's employee at those locations gets up in the morning and says, I can't wait to sell more vanilla milkshakes between 6 to 8 a.m. I think they probably get up and say, I can't wait to sell uh, bacon, egg, and cheese and coffee between 6 to 8 a.m. And that could be the difference between a million-dollar business and a billion-dollar business uh, because at the end of the day, Starbucks sells one cup of coffee billions of times over and over and over and over again. And I'll end Johnny and we can get into another part of the conversation that I think why this is so important for strategic planning and financials and business development and not just customer discovery is because, and I'm, I'm a, I'm a sports, uh, sports baseball guy is because Derek Jeter, you know, Yank, sorry, just lost, but whatever, we'll get it next year. Um, Derek Jeter had to field a routine ground ball 99% of the time, and he made amazing plays, you know, 
he, he really did, but he did that mostly one to 2% of the time. And if you can't figure out the customer discovery and the coffee cup and the uh, McDonald's vanilla milkshake and do that 99% of the time, then that's the difference between a $50,000 difference uh, business and a million dollar business and a billion dollar business. So I'll, I'll end with that at least as an intro to rev some people up. Great, great. Thanks, Danny. And to me, the ingenuity of this model is actually redefining the word job. Because when we think of job, we think of what do I have to do? But what we're saying in jobs to be done is, what job is my product or service doing for the customer? And the primary component around this <clears throat> is interviews with customers. Now, everybody knows that everybody is told all the time, you need to run focus groups, you need to survey your customers, you need to know what they're thinking, but how much do we need to do it? And the other really nice thing about the jobs to be done model is they say, don't kill yourself on this. Go out and get seven to 10 interviews with existing customers and we'll talk a little bit more. I'm actually gonna do a, a quick screen share on one side that I think is really valuable about you know, what are we talking to these customers about and what are they helping us discover? But by really understanding what problem are we solving for this customer, and it might not be the problem that we thought we were solving for the customer, we can take a fresh look at our product, at our customer, at our branding, and at our go-to-market strategy. So again, as I said at the beginning, we hope everyone takes time, even if you think you're sure you know what your product does, you're sure you know who your audience is, that you dig into these a little deeper. So again, the methodology is to uh, follow a very set list of questions to identify existing customers or customers if you're not launched into the market yet that you think are your ideal customer and walk them through a set of questions that could take 10 to 30 minutes uh, and jot down all the answers. And then this information is going to help you create an understanding of the problem that you're solving for your customer that you'll then take and move into your customer persona, which is what are the one, two, or three idealized versions of our customer that we can then use as we're developing our branding, our marketing, and our go-to-market strategy. With that, I am going to... But Johnny, if I, could, if I could make a comment on this, it's, um, you know, we're talking about jobs to be done and customer discovery, but it's it's important. I, I just shared in the chat as context, historical context here. Sorry if I get put my professor cap on. I was uh, teaching some undergrad and graduate classes at Iona uh, over the past couple of years. So I think having the historical context of what informed jobs to be done is really important. Clay Christensen actually started uh, in team development and figuring out uh, what the best way for systems to work within organizations. And he arrived at what we could call an early development or early form of jobs to be done, known as the agreement matrix. And it's in that article, that's why I shared it. It's fairly short, it's in Harvard Business Review. And um, you know, there is, there's two dimensions to the agreement uh, matrix that really are fully, um, uh, embodying jobs to be done. And that is that he wanted to figure out what employees at the company wanted in working at that company and how they wanted to achieve their growth in that company. And basically, eventually in his writings, he said, wait a second, if I just replace the word employee with customer, then I think it's probably the same thing. What do they want and how do they want to achieve what they want? And the role of jobs to be done is to try to figure out the sh you know what they need to make happen and i think often you know and, and i've done this and so many others you know we believe and we've been taught and this is why it was such a huge shift in entrepreneurship that i could just wake up and say i have a great idea and i want to build it this way and it's going to change the world this way, and it's going to do this, and I'm going to do that, and I'm going to do that. And it basically is changing the I statements from I have an idea to, well, what does the customer want or need based on their idea of the product? Um, and I think that can go from selling a flat screen smart TV at Best Buy 
or Target all the way to a, a vehicle, to Uber, to the new product that's going to be built tomorrow. Great. And and Danny, that that really gets to the heart of it is one of the things that we say at HVCI is smash into the customer. Meaning if you're not engaging your customer all the time, uh, then you don't really know what your customer wants. And especially if you're pre-launch or you're designing a product and you're 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 like, oh, well, I know people want this product. I have stores that are calling me that are saying, we need your product. We'll put it on the shelves. The store's not your customer, right? The, the, the consumer is your customer. So what I've put up on the screen uh, is a, a sort of a good way to look at the framework and, the, and an outline of the questions that uh, you would ask your customers. Again, we have a worksheet that will be shared afterward. You can use to actually fill it in as you do these interviews. But we wanna talk about the five areas uh, that the jobs to be done model covers. So these are unmet desires of the customer, constraints, that the customer has around the problem. Catalyst, when did this cut question, this problem, this challenge come about in the customer life or journey? Uh, the choice set, as Danny referenced earlier, the choice set is often more expansive than we think it is um, and possibly than the customer thinks it is. And a choice set assessment of all of the possible solutions to this problem, why did you choose this one? And again, this, uh, choice that they made might be they chose your product. It might be that they currently chose a competitor's product and you're really trying to understand that solution. And when I say the word competitor, this is another thing that, that we lean into a lot. I want folks to have a pretty expansive view of competitor. And this is another thing that the jobs to be done framework can help open your eyes about. If you're a liquor brand, if you're, uh, if you're a vodka brand, you may think that your competitor is other vodkas. That may or may not be the case, depending on how you're really positioning yourself in the market and what desires vodka drinkers have out there in the market. Um, it may be that you're trying to have a superior taste. It may be that you want a lower alcohol vodka. And I'll tell you, 15 years ago, nobody would have thought of that. But if you're not following the low alcohol and non-alcohol trend in cocktails today, and you're in that industry, then you, you might be missing an opportunity. Uh, so there's there's two... Um, implementation points that I, I want to make on this. And, you know, I think maybe some folks at this point might be going, okay, I get it. Let's, you know, I need to go talk to people. I think it, it'd be compelling to see those questions, right? I'm trying to put myself in, in the shoes of someone attending. Okay, I get it. Let me go talk to seven to 10 people and come back. Well, what, what do I do next? You know, or what is that really going to result in? Uh, I think if we started from the the end and worked backwards, you you have to constantly as an entrepreneur, I guess when I say you, I include myself in this, you all uh, need to figure out how you're going to spend your time and your money constantly. And in a way, I mean, it sounds a little harsh, but it's like we only really have time for people that care about what we're building or we care about what they need. And, and then we have to go after that more and more and more. So it's a marketing campaign. It's a social post. It's a call to action on a website. It's it's a phone script. It's a having a proposal ready. It's a contract. It's all of those things that need to result in that new business. Uh, and I think when we think about marketing and the output for that revenue, and and think about customer discovery in that light, it really should change the game. So the implementation piece of this is number one, and I think that I struggle with this the most. You have to go slower to go faster. Uh, when I worked, you know, the first startup I was a part of, we supported the Department of Defense and the special operations community. So I worked for years with a lot of those, what they call tip of the spears professionals. And when you're working with like a SEAL Team 6 and who's determined to be like the best organization in the world, and they start to say, well, we have to get it right and have fundamentals and muscle memory to then go really, really fast when the moment happens. Well, it's hard to say, I need to go interview 10 people this week, uh, but I need to clean the toilet at the brewery. My brother owns a, a brewery in Yonkers, right? And then I have to figure out the social posts. And then I have to I have to have these meetings with the accountant and the financial planner. And then I have to go visit these locations and I have to host these events and I have to do that. Next thing you know, you're saying to your spouse also, I haven't had, a chance to do anything this week. You know, so I think if 
that is that's like the ground ball. Do you want that to be your ground ball over and over and over again? Or do you want to repeatedly interview seven to 10 people a month, maybe even bi-weekly if you could get to that point, and now it's informing over and over and over again your customer discovery because it never stops. So that's the second part. If you took the time to figure it out, the second part is to then make it a part of strategic planning. And I don't, I personally don't care if it's a one person shop or a hundred person team to do that. If it's being done, you're going to be at the tip of the spear with the customer and understanding their needs. I think the smaller that that circle is, the more revenue that you're going to generate, which is completely the opposite that I was taught when I was growing up. You know, if you hyper, hyper, hyper focus on who that customer is and their need, you will go deeper, like a mile deep, not a mile wide. And, and everything in your organization will be focused, every fundamental will be focused on generating that revenue from that customer. So I think the questions are really compelling, but I'm trying to give the philosophy and energy behind it to just constantly do it over and over and over again. And motivation and consistency continue to be the two top topics uh, that, that business school uh, professors and researchers research over and over and over again. So it's, it's clearly an issue uh, for business professionals to grow organizations motivation for this and consistency for this over and over again great thanks danny so i think you hit it and, and hopefully we've we've described this model uh in in sufficient uh depth there we do encourage you uh as well as uh the background that danny shared there's great youtube videos from harvard business review uh that that dive a little deeper into this but what I've just put up on the screen is the is the very simple one pager that we recommend that you use when you're doing interviews here. Again, we did not create this. This is our branded version of the sheet. But you can see here we're talking about uh, the the jobs to be done here. You know what you can literally this question: What job did you did you hire? What were you seeking to achieve? What were you trying to get done? Um, and where, when, and why? when this job occurred to you. Uh, a common example that, that we've seen is um, buying a new car, right? And what car do you choose? Um, and if you look at the minivan, uh, you can imagine folks who bought a minivan um, have a certain set of needs, right? I know when we bought our first minivan, Danny shared he has four kids, I have three, uh, they're all a little older now. Um, it was because we ran out of room, right? It was the classic soccer mom stuff. But as you dig in, to these questions, you can find out, am I competing with other minivans or am I competing with SUVs? Am I competing with all three row vehicles, which is what happened to come in for myself and I believe for Danny, it's like, oh, we've outgrown a two row car. So now we have a limit in our, in our set there. And now those companies like Subaru and Honda and Acura, which I know are the ones that we looked at, um, know that they have to narrow their focus for those customers when they're looking at that product line. Um, so again, uh, I'm not going to read all of this to each of you, but I wanted to give you an outline of sort of the brass tacks of it. Here's the worksheet that we hope to work on. Um, that's an outline of jobs to be done. And uh, for us, we've all gone through this exercise with our own businesses in the HVCI accelerator. We've had dozens of companies go through this as well. And it always helps folks in companies that have been around for a while or brand new co companies really clarify what is the product, what is the opportunity, what is the problem, and how are we a potential solution or do we have to pivot in what we're doing? Uh, and, and speaking of pivot, um, from, from identifying the job, the problem, the next step is who is having this problem, who is hiring you for this job? So the second topic, and we're usually gonna try to stick to one topic, but these two pair very well together, is the customer persona. Um, and this is a, a topic that you may be familiar with, but that's gonna help you move from, what does my customer need 
to who is my customer that then is going to bring me how do I reach out to my customer? Where do I find my customer? Danny? I think uh, just to, you know, to help land the plane a little bit, there's a Hudson Valley based startup called Burbio, uh, which is sort of starting to move into, let's say, a, a, you know, a true small mid-sized startup company in scaling. And, and, you know, in the early days, they used jobs to be done to figure out, uh, you know, who their core customer was. And I'll tell you, within three months, they completely uh, sort of radically at, at that point changed the business model uh, from local bank branches to libraries. It sounds, uh, you know, it's almost kind of like laughable. I mean, Dennis and I sometimes do laugh about it because libraries, I, I, you know, two years ago, two and a half years ago, and now are like, that's kind of a generally speaking archaic, you know, a system, right? You just walk in, there's books, you take it out. Yes, they have the digital, but it's still essentially you got to go pick it up or it gets mailed to you and just doing that over. That's their cup of coffee over and over again. But when Dennis was doing it, around, what's that? What's that? Until they pivoted again. And then they pivoted again. That's right. Now they work with, you know, big, big companies like Microsoft and the, the you know, big organization at the government like CDC, um, you know, through the pandemic. But the, the, the aperture, right, that I talked about before and the question of like that employee getting up and saying, I'm going to sell a lot of coffee this morning versus I'm going to sell a lot of vanilla milkshakes was what Dennis was going through. So he was going literally bank branch to bank branch, all different brands and, and companies and trying to ask them how many parents or families had accounts there because he wanted to. Uh, you know, to achieve engagement with parents because they were providing school-based information on events and activities that in a calendar at that time that parents needed. And believe it or not, it, it, it didn't exist, you know, at the time. And the banks just weren't seeing the value. So after, you know, two, three months, they had zero, like big fat egg, zero, uh, you know, revenue and, and users and clients. Then they started going to libraries and saying, well, parents probably spend a lot of time with their children at libraries. And literally within three to six months, they had thousands and thousands and thousands of users and parents specifically on their platform. And now they were left with the problem of how do we scale the platform and the data and the reporting to give them more value that they're asking for. So then it became a case of asking the same questions jobs to be done with like, well, do you want it this way or this way, you know, now that we're providing you the value? So it, it there could be a big fat Easter egg, Johnny, I think it, that's my point too in this process, but going slower might actually be uh, faster in, in the future. Uh, so I'm trying to give an on the ground example of how this was employed. And, and I think another aspect that you mentioned, Danny, about revisiting these questions, a lot of us have a solution. And our solutions may be run of the mill, right? I sell liquor, I sell flowers, I sell meat, I sell fitness, um, I sell skincare products. Um, there's lots of those out there in the market. There's lots of products out there in the market. There's lots of people who sell those in the market. But I'm going to need to get more specific in order to get a bigger market. And that sounds contradictory, right? I should just serve everybody. Um, but it's just like priorities right? If you have too many priorities, you don't have any priorities. If you're trying to sell your product to everybody because everybody should have softer skin or everybody should have fresh flowers, um, then you're not going to know how to grab your customer's attention. You need, you don't need to be something for everyone. You need to be everything for one or two people. And, and that is going to really change the way that you look at uh, your product or your business. The other thing that I want to talk about on the jobs to be done, because I know we have brick and mortar companies and we have e-commerce companies or we have brick and mortar companies that are looking to expand their e-commerce is that where, that where, when, and why question becomes really important. Um, I saw, for instance, I don't know if uh, uh, Jean-Michel from Mega Brains comic book store in Rhinebeck is on the call, but in his application, mm -hmm. He shared that he was on a back street in Rhinebeck with a brand new comic book store and nobody was showing up there. He moved to a main street to Market Street in Rhinebeck, totally changed his business. Might seem obvious, right? Foot traffic. 
I will tell you from my experience, if he interviewed me about jobs to be done, what problem is a comic book store solving for me? It's entertaining my kids for 20 to 30 minutes in between other things that we're doing in Rhinebeck. And if that costs me the price of a few comics or a few video games in the back room, it's totally worth it, right? That might not be what you think you're selling for when you're selling comic books. You think you're there to entertain. Maybe you've got a series that tries mm -hmm. to get people to see themselves in their heroes, et cetera. But his customer might tell him that his real, his real job to be done is to time waste for my kids so that I can get a little break, right? So maybe and he's going to drive traffic at that in the way that he brands outside his foot traffic. So I think, you know, also what's driving this as well, and this is the these are the two reasons why, you know, we all need to plan it as a part of our biweekly, monthly, quarterly, um, you know, business development is circumstance, which always changes, right? Uh, your preference for coffee might not change or it might change less, right? And your routine might change less over time, but it could change when you visit different places or if you, um, as you grow older and your taste buds and whatnot, and there's a science behind that. But circumstance is the core central tenant of jobs to be done. So that's the I statement shifting to the, you know, the we statement or they statement of the customer that you don't have to, uh, take a guess at what that circumstance is. Just go talk to a whole bunch of people and figure that out. And the output of 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 these questions relative to circumstance is the theme or the core capability that you will easily, easily discover. And that's the thing about jobs to be done. And the reason why the science says seven to to ten or some sometimes seven to fifteen, if it's a core like software platform, you know, people over and over and over again, because you will be able to deduce and arrive at a summary of a theme. The second is experience. And, you know, Airbnb has, I don't know if, if uh, I can find this resource and share it, Bryn, uh, with you so you could push it out. But Airbnb has a one level one to a level 10 experience that they have internally um, that they keep as, as a part of their like sort of like Bible. And what that means to them is a one experience for a customer using Airbnb probably equals something like you book and you never hear and you go and it's the worst place and you don't get an apology and you don't get a follow up and you don't get a lot of things. A 10 is as soon as Johnny books, I call Johnny. I don't email him. I don't text him. I call him and say, Johnny, I saw that you put down that you love to, uh, do you love the snowboard? Uh, I'm going to have a limo pick you up. There will be two snowboards on the top of the, the limo or the, you know, the, the Escalade, whatever it's going to be. And by the time you get to the house, don't worry about it. There will be two boots there because I asked you what your sizes are already. And I'll leave flowers and chocolates for you guys because I want you to be welcome because you mentioned it's part of your honeymoon uh, or, or whatever it is, you know, your 20 year anniversary. I mean, then next thing you know, two days later, uh, a new bag of coffee shows up because you're spending four or five days. The point is, with understanding the circumstance, you can go now and say, what kind of experience do I want them to have? Like, I think, Maggie, you're like bread and butter in that couture experience, right? You know, figuring out all these fine details. But the point of jobs to be done is most people, and and I've done this, I'm, I'm an over-analytic guy my wife you know I, I share a lot with my wife and she always says you're just overthinking everything is i would have built the 10 experience first and then i would have been like why don't people enjoy this like i this is amazing but the point is it's amazing in my brain not in their brain and not yeah i don't want flowers or i just want to go and ski right but until you test that you don't know yeah awesome with looking at the time, I hope this guy's get, this gives everyone an understanding of why we think jobs to be done is a good model and why we think it's super critical that you're constantly engaging your customer. We can talk uh, more in future sessions or on Slack. I highly recommend folks get engaged in a conversation about jobs to be done and how to use it in our Slack channels um, to, to see how it can be useful for you. But with that, I want to shift from once you know what job your product is doing, what do you know about the people that it's doing it for? 
And for that, yes, we can customer survey and yes, we can research demographics of types of people who want our product. Uh, but it it's important to take this information and the actual customers and distill them into somewhat of an ideal customer or two or three. And the reason I say or two or three is not because I think you should try to serve many different customer types uh, with your one product, but it's because you might be a two or three sided marketplace, or you might be selling to brick and mortar customers and online customers, and those are gonna be two archetypes, right? But we really do wanna focus on those primary customers, and there, there's two big aspects to it. Who are our customers and who are not our customers, right? And we're gonna look at this in Jobs to be Done. Who do we, who are we not gonna be able to serve, right? Um, I'll go back to, I know we have a, a distillery in, in, our, uh, in our program. I'll go back to, to that example you may want to compete in the highest end vodka and compete with all of the highest end vodka people, but that's going to be a crowded market and it's going to be really expensive. Whereas if you decide to go organic or we're selling local or lower alcohol content, you're going to niche in and you're going to define the person, right? The low alcohol persona is, you can imagine the kind of person that might be, but it's also going to be a much younger person, surprisingly, because the younger generations of drinkers are not looking to drink the way that the 40 somethings were looking to drink. So I'm going to bring up our worksheet. I think it's sort of best to just get right to the brass tacks on this one in terms of how do we define our customer and what's most important about it. Uh, and, and during that, I'm going to let Danny jump in a little more on customer persona and why we added this to the mix as we journey through discovering your customer all the way to launching and, and engaging your, your selling your product. Danny, do you want to pick up a little bit on customer persona and I'll bring up our worksheet? Yeah. So now let's assume that you conducted, you know, some interviews and you try to arrive at a theme. Uh, one exercise that you could get into, and, and this is sort of the original of the empathy map. Um, yeah. And Johnny's, Johnny's bringing up, some of the customer persona type stuff is to figure out really what you know how to enact this and implement this um, through this discovery and if you if you start to understand their circumstance then you could start to figure out maybe what demographics you have to talk to specifically and where they are and what they're doing and what they're thinking about and what other products they use and and how they use them and all that kind of in-depth um, you know, information. A lot of it is based on uh, what they call pattern of life. It, it sounds, uh, you know, to some people, they've joked, it's like, it sounds a little creepy, you know, that, like you would really know uh, almost everything that someone would be doing. Um, but I, I think it's generally a pattern of life of where they're spending their time and how they're spending their time. And it's the same question that I think you'd be asking as an entrepreneur, how you need to spend time with them and the money with them to, to make that happen. So this empathy mapping, is trying to understand at a deeper level this set of customers that you have now and what they're saying and what they're thinking and what they're actually doing on a day-to-day -day basis or a week-to-week -week basis or however often that might be. Um, one example of this is, you know, I'll, I'll give up to I'll give two small examples. One sort of general that's been used, and one one maybe more personal. Uh, the first would be someone walks in, I mentioned this before, and, and wants to buy a, a television at Best Buy or at Target. And imagine if the salesperson started with I statements, right? Oh, this is the best 65 inch. You can watch a lot of games on it. You can watch movies. You can have movie night on Friday. You can order ice cream. It'd be a great experience and so on and so forth. There's a example that Bryn, we could share with Jamie sort of at the center of this. And she's saying things like, I don't know if I want to watch the game or movies on Friday night. I just need something for my kitchen for the kids in the morning while we're getting ready for school. So if we understand that pattern of life behavior, the solution could actually be a mile deep, not a mile wide, right? We talked about that before. You go a mile deep on someone. And I don't, I, it could be like a color or a Pantone on something. But I think the point is it's even like more, it's more vital than that. It's, you know, are you putting honey in your tea or sugar in your tea? You know, are you drinking 
uh, this type of tea at this time, you know, oh, you drink orange blossom tea every evening, not in the morning. What do you drink in the morning? Oh, I drink black tea in the morning. You know, it's like, so if we're trying to sell something to those folks, I think it's just now let's say we have those seven to 10 people that are ideal customers after jobs to be done. Well, it should be, tell me a little bit more about what else you're doing and how you're doing it. What are you thinking during this? And the right customers will spend the time because they want it to be a better solution. So like I use Ursa Major, a Vermont-based uh, like, um, you know, like a deodorant or, or shampoo conditioner company. And they're trying to get me to just be a subscriber and to get 10% off, you know, on a, on the, I think it's a five to six, six week basis that they think that's when I'll need the next phase. But I'm like, no, the cost is too prohibitive for me. I'm not going to do that. I would love, I, I feel like I'm trying to track them down to tell them, no, I, I want a subscription for like three months, like a quarterly thing. And I will sign up like that. No, crazy. But the cost is prohibitive. If they bundled it just a little bit more, but maybe I'm not the right person, you know, for them. There's the oat milk example. I don't know if uh, this has been fairly recent in the last like five, six months where oat milk, uh, you know, as, as the brand, that's the brand, you know, actually puts on their um, on their um, their product now as an ad of customers saying how bad it is. Because right underneath that, they'll say, this person is not our customer, but we asked them to share it with three people that, that will love oat milk because they just want to go a mile deep on people that love oat milk. So part of their discovery, because their head of marketing gave an interview, and they're like, yeah, but we kind of want to find the people that hate our product so that we know not to spend time with them. And it, it sounds harsh, but that's entirely the point to just go a mile deep with the right people. And I, I've tried to boil the ocean and I've gotten overtired, overwhelmed, overcommitted on so many things over my life. Great, thanks, Danny. So what I, what I have on the screen now, and again, we great question in the chat. We will share all the resources that I'm putting up on the screen with you to make seven copies of and do your interviews and, and fill them out. What we have here is the buyer persona template, and I'm actually gonna go right to the top left where it says name. We want you to give this person a name. We want you to really understand this person. We've seen folks going through this process, give them an image. You see right there a, a person image, a generic person image. We want that person to become real for you. We want, after, after these conversations in your research, to be able to picture this ideal customer. And in your business conversations internally, your marketing conversations, your go-to-market conversations, you're gonna go back to this person and say, are we really serving this person? Because it doesn't seem like the, the direction we're going is gonna serve this person as well as we should. Um, I also uh, was reminded as Danny was uh, sharing more about this, uh, this concept that I have seen some folks say, well, the only problem is that I need to train my customer in how valuable my product is. This to me is sort of a, a, a red flag or at least a yellow flag that we may not be finding the right customer or we might not be solving the right pain point unless we are an education company. But if we are a flower company and our marketing strategy or, or our problem is that people don't realize how valuable it is to have flowers inside their home, how much healthier they feel, how calm, much calmer they are. These might be my personal beliefs, but not the problem that I'm solving for my customers. So you can see here on this uh, buyer persona template that I have up, a lot of reiteration of the kinds of questions that you'll have in jobs to be done, but allows you to consolidate them into, again, that one or two customer avatars that are our ideal customer. And the other part of, uh, of the buyer persona that isn't necessarily on here, I sort of think of the back of the worksheet, is who are we not and who are we not serving right there are there are some customers that need to be ignored or fired right uh, my first bootstrap business was kickball for grown-ups this is not something anyone should take seriously um, we offered it at a low price point we gave them a great time on the field and in the bars it was a massive social scene and i had customers who would email their customer rep three times a week 
complaining about the rules or the refereeing or some violation. And I'm like, give them their money back and tell them that they need to go find semi-pro sports because that's not the customer we're serving. <laughs> now, we ended up moving into that market, but we developed a new customer persona because we saw a big group of folks who wanted post-collegiate competition in a, in a non-traditional sport. So then we ended up serving them, but it wasn't until we found that customer that screamed that need that we got into it. Um, with that, I am actually going to pause right there because we're at 1201. And I know that we have folks who very anything like us, they got to jump to their next meeting. We'll remind you that this is being recorded and you can catch up on the rest of it later. Uh, but I also want to say that we're coming near the end of this session. So we've looked at how do we talk to our customers to make sure we actually know the pain points that they're having and the jobs to be done. And we've looked at how do we consolidate that along with research into clearly defining the people that we want to serve. Uh, with that, I am going to open up the floor if anybody has any clarifying questions or wants to provide a specific example of, I don't get at all how this applies to my business so that we can talk through that a little bit because I think that might be an illuminating example. And then we're going to wrap it up just in the next five minutes or so. And from there, we'll move forward uh, for those that are in the full program into the sounding board and uh, launch into the deep dives. And if we don't have any questions, we'll just wrap it up. And, and Johnny, just quick point. Can you unshare your, yes. your screen just so we can see uh, your face? I'm happy to take any, any questions. All right. Susan has a question. So we're going to make sure that you unmute yourself and go ahead and ask a question. Thank you for the session. Um, so in my business, which is a distillery, we serve distributors. Through them, we serve bars and restaurants and liquor stores. And we also serve customers that visit us on site here at the distillery for cocktails and tastings on the weekends. So I'm assuming that I'm looking to define all of those different segments of customers. Is that like three basic customer segments that you see there? Well, the liquor stores have different concerns and the bars and restaurants that have different concerns from yeah. the people that come visit us. So, so we start with the customers with different uh, problems that I'm solving. Right. So in my, if I was going through this, I'd start with the end customer in mind, right? Who's that, that consumer. Um, and, and then I'd work my way backward, which for me would go to the restaurants and be like, what are they asking for that they're not getting? You know, what's, right. You know what's really happening there and then the wholesalers are going to be getting those requests from the restaurants and bars right so mm -hmm. i work from the consumer back towards myself from the okay. the indirect sale to the most direct sale but i do see three personas and possibly that means if we're going to do seven interviews that might mean you're going to do 21 interviews right to try to really get to this great question yeah, i think the second Thanks. part of that it could be, you know, if you if you look at, remember, I made the point about the three SKUs, uh, you know, in, in food beverage. If you look at your financials and see what's selling the most uh, with your spirits, you know, for example, the like the Beacon Bourbon, you know, might be one of the top. I think if you could pair jobs to be done and the personas with your financials because you might want to spend, I mean, you want folks to come in and taste and whatnot, but you still have to look at the pie chart and say, well, 82% is coming from these things. So I need to spend, you know, a hundred percent right now on that skew right. that's selling at these things. So I would not, not everything is equal and should be treated equal. It should be treated as the beachhead to get in. If you want to make that a big part of the strategy or a doubling down on that mile deep to go after that even more. And, and my belief is like, like for for example, when I'm coaching U11 soccer this past fall, it's like, I mean, by the way, these boys curse more than I do, right? I mean, what they're saying to each other and how they're acting. But we all together could come up with, generally speaking, what a U11 boy is thinking about with sports and in school. And so just if you find those seven to 10 attributes, it, it's like just spend time with those attributes, with those people and if uh, if someone you're selling to is asking for 40 percent less of that it's going to take you the same amount of time and effort to sell to that person as it is to going to sell to an easier known 
customer. So, and you hit on something pretty important there, which is we have that avatar, that customer avatar in the center of our mind. And as we're working with customers as the business owner, and maybe we're training our team to do this as well, we want to listen for that dissonance. And there's two ways we can deal with that. If the customer doesn't seem like our customer avatar, then we're going to be like, okay, I'm not going to dig real deep in and try to sell or serve this person. But if we keep hearing customers like that, then we have to rethink our customer avatar and be like, is there a new segment emerging that, that we're not sure of? Mm. And, and this is good, but it can also be a total distraction. So right. in the sounding boards and the one-on-ones, we'll talk a little more about strategic and tactical work, right? And strategic work like jobs to be done should be done continuously, but in discrete things, maybe quarterly, maybe annually. If you try to redo your customer persona every week, you're gonna drive yourself mad, right? Because like uh, going back to my business, I would have a new customer service rep who would come to me and want to please everyone. And I'm like, that's just not your customer that, you know, we're not going to start playing pickleball. Yes, we missed the boat. Pickleball's huge. But just because you have a few people asking for it in Miami doesn't mean I'm going to roll out a whole new product nationwide. Right. So we need to listen for it, but not get distracted by it. Great. Right. On that, we're going to try to take two more questions and then we're going to wrap it up. Uh, is it Helana? You need to unmute uh, yourself. Helena. Yeah, Helena. Go ahead. So I'm a startup um, and um, curious as to how, you know, I don't really have customers yet. So who are you going to interview? And yeah, go find who you think your customers are and talk to them. Go to your competitors' customers and talk to them. <laughs> this is a lot of the folks that uh, Danny and I worked with in the accelerator uh, is that they have a concept and they maybe have done some interviews or more likely they're solving a personal pain point and a personal problem. And, and you're likely not alone in that personal problem, but you come from a unique set of experiences. So we need to go out and make sure that we actually understand other customers' problems and that we can get it in there. So, so anybody who's on your mailing list or who has expressed mm -hmm. interest in what you're doing already, your competition, um, or who you think your likely customer is. Uh, just, you know, phone call, text message, Facebook, walk in and let them know what you're doing. And and ask for 15 minutes. I think just a little bit more on the logistical side, it, it looks like you're in healthcare. So are you going into a new industry with the startup? Um, yeah, I've been a certified nurse midwife for 20, since 97. And yes, yeah. yeah, so um, an e-commerce, well, soon to okay. be. Um, jigsaw puzzle retailer, um, focusing yeah. on diversity, equity, and inclusion puzzles. Great. So, so the reason why I asked that is, uh, w w it's a little bit of a parallel track. But P Peter Thiel, found one of the first founders, investors in Facebook, uh, wrote a book called Zero to One, and and z basically he summarizes that there's startups that are going zero to one and one to two. Johnny, I know the whole like context here, but in this case. The zero to one concept is you're building something brand new from zero to something new, one, which is your shift to industry. Like if if Susan went to to do a brewery, I'd be like, well, that's kind of a one to two. That's not a zero to one based on her experience. So there might be more less risk that I'd be taking with that. So it might actually be more important for you to talk to an influencer being someone that might have access to 50 potential interviews as opposed to just painstakingly trying to find the first 10. So yeah. go talk to people that in, in that parallel side that you think are a beachhead to that and go ask them for five to 10 people to talk to. And, and another one on this one, so you're also in a new brick and mortar space, right? Uh, I believe in your example. Now you're moving not it. yet not yet so I'm redoing the floors <laughs> right like i talked about with the comic book store uh you've got two customers right you've got your walk by customers and you've got your hopefully online customers right a big qr yeah. code on the side of your new retail location saying you want to learn more or influence the way that you know we do our business and that can lead to interviews right so yeah. you, you can accept i'm um, like I don't interact much with social media or, you know, that. So I actually have, I'm paying somebody to at least get it right. going for three to six months and hopefully take over. To be very clear, you could put a sign on the door that says, 
Do you want to know more about this this, this jigsaw puzzle business that's diversity that's opening up here? Call this number. Send me an email and it, turn it into a customer interview. That's your walk by traffic. You're going to instantly know that you're piquing somebody's interest that's going to be a walk by component of your business. At the same time online, whether it's you or your social media manager, we get out there and we raise those questions and, and ask them to come to us if they're interested in that. Great. Irving, last question. Um, I'm in the town of Newburgh and I started probably in the pandemic area because I'm doing holistic CBD health and wellness. And I'm not just concentrating on CBD, I'm concentrating um, specifically on the growth of our cannabinoid system. We forget that we are a plant-based system and by using so much different plant holistic medicine, it helps us besides the pharmaceutical area. And I'm just trying to, I'm grabbing it. And the, oh my God. Oh no. Uh oh, CBD. We lost him. But I'm going to answer the question anyway from, from what I heard there. And hopefully he can pick it up on the recording. I hope everybody's all right over there. So, what I think I heard is he's in the CBD medical space. He's looking at expanding people's knowledge base, right? Mm -hmm. So, this is a point con. Contrary to what I said earlier about education as, as a primary tool set, where there's an emerging product and an emerging industry, and education is key. And in the CBD space right now, they do talk about, well, I'm going to replace your aspirin. I'm going to replace your skin cream. I'm going to do these things. What I believe he was talking about is, the, as he mentioned, the wider cannabinoid <laughs> system, which I, I happen to have also done some research on. And he wants folks to know how the human body works and why the stigma of marijuana doesn't have much to do with the product and the systems of CBD uh, in that space. And so for, for him, if I was looking at the jobs to be done, I'd be contacting folks who have either sell to folks who have ailments that I think CBD uh, can provide some curative for, or the folks themselves who are maybe going into CVS. Mm -hmm. I might even stand in the, you know, depending on how he's uh, recommending that CBD is used. I don't know the exact formulation of the product. I might stand in CVS in the appropriate aisle and watch people pick out a, a pain cream or a toppercin or something and say, hey, this may sound weird, but I would love to know why you're choosing that product. Right? So he can do his jobs to be done in a CVS. Yeah. So I think that there's two uh, fundamental things that we're kind of talking about, sort of beating around the bush too, that's implied to me in that question and experience. Number one, you have to always assess and confirm what, what business you're in. So when I hear the word community, uh, I get concerned sometimes that you're going to end up spending all your time just engaging the community. Uh, you know, and that community could be the newsletter, social media, it could be hosting an event, whatnot. It is a fundamental of a business nowadays that you have to build and grow and engage your community. It's a given. Like, if you're not doing it, then you're probably not going to be growing. However, you can't, the fundamentals and the, and, and the functions of your business need to be focused on the service product, not just geared towards the community engagement. The community engagement is a path to growth. So I think always, always understanding where you're spending your time and whatnot uh, is, is vitally important. And I think that the, the second thing here is, always assessing and confirming the value of your product. You know, there, my wife just went to a, a major conference uh, about a week ago and the keynote speaker started a skincare product for one specific, uh, you know, experience that women had, you know, relative to their face, even specifically on their cheeks. And then eventually 20 years later, she was COO of L'Oreal, but she started with that one very specific product. So with that, it's okay to go deeper on that. It, the smaller that circle, the more depth you might actually have with that revenue, you know, and figuring that out and spending time. So constantly assessing that, I think, is really important and knowing what business you're in all the time. Great. Thank you, Danny. And that's where we're going to have to wrap it up. I hope this session was informative, gave you some new thinking about what either a new business or or an old business that you can refresh on. 
Uh, when we send out the handouts, I hope that you all take an opportunity to leverage those and to get out there and engage your customer and redefine your customer to yourself. Um, again, I'm going to encourage everyone to join the Slack and uh, we'll let you know that we are going to send out an email follow up to all attendees as well as anyone who's already registered in the program. Um, and also want to mention next week, we're going to be talking about your product, defining your product and your offering with a focus on minimum viable products. So this is towards brand extensions or new products and unit economics, which is something that should be important to everyone. As, as So we, we really understand how can we test new product extensions to these customers that we've defined and found, or how can we launch a new product in the fastest way? I'm not going to say cheapest, but the fastest way. Um, and then we look at unit economics because we're going to have to start building the financials of this business or business segment. Uh, with that, I do uh, I did need to give one reminder that if you've already filled out the application for the complete program and you've received an email about a sounding board invite, you're in the program. Please make sure to follow up on the sounding boards. Make sure you're available for all your sessions. We're going to move the Monday Halloween session, so maybe to the end of the six week program because. My Halloween starts at four. I don't know about everybody else, but five o'clock isn't going to work for me. Um, but with that, I want to thank everyone in the program and who's interested in this. I hope that this was valuable. We'd love your feedback. We're going to send around a survey. We'd like folks uh, to please provide so that we can continually iterate ourselves and listen to our customers. Uh, Bryn had to go, uh, so I'll say goodbye for Bryn as well. Uh, Danny, thank you for joining us as our subject matter expert. Uh, next week, we will also be uh, adding an entrepreneur to the mix who's a local entrepreneur uh, in the food uh, category, so CPG. Uh, I know some folks are in that category or at least a retail good, uh, and that may feel uh, something that you can you can grab onto there. Uh, with that, I'm going to say goodbye. Danny, thank you, and everyone have a, yeah, everyone. Have a great afternoon. You got it. Have a good one. All right. Good night. Bye-bye.